Good afternoon. My name is Kyle Roberts, and I'm the Executive Director of the Congregational Library and Archives. Welcome to today's spooky virtual discussion on Invisible Agents, Witchcraft in Congregational Church Records with Dr. Tricia Pione, Project Director for New England's Hidden Histories. To begin, I want to acknowledge that the Congregational Library and Archives resides in what is now known as Boston, which is in the place of the Blue Hills, the homeland of the Massachusetts people, whose relationships and connections with the land continue to this day and into the future. For those joining us for the first time, the Congregational Library and Archives is an independent research library. Established in 1853, CLA's mission is to foster a deeper understanding of the spiritual, intellectual, cultural, and civic dimensions of the congregational story and its ongoing relevance in the 21st century. We do this through free access to our research library of 225,000 books, manuscripts, periodicals, and prints, and our digital archive with more than 100,000 images, many drawn from our New England's Hidden Histories project. And today you're gonna to learn more about some of the materials in that wonderful project. Throughout the year, we offer educational programs and research fellowships for students, scholars, churches, and anyone interested in congregationalism's influence on the American story. Please do check our website, congregationallibrary.org, to learn more about what we do and for news of forthcoming events. In some ways, doing this program uh, flows naturally from the work that New England's Hidden History does. Uh, our speaker, Dr. Trisha Pione, is the project director for New England's Hidden Histories at the Congregation Library and Archives. She holds a PhD in history from the University of New Hampshire with a specialization in the early modern Atlantic world and in the history of science. Prior to joining the CLA, she was a research scholar at Historic New England for the Recovering New England's Voices Project and has previously worked as a lecturer and historical consultant. Dr. Pion's scholarship focuses on early modern magic and witchcraft, and her work on these subjects has appeared in journals, books, blogs, and on radio and television. So, Trisha, I can't think of a better person to lead us uh, in, this, in this presentation today. And I think one of the things that might be interesting for folks watching out there is that when you and I talk each quarter about the most viewed pages in our digital archive, they come back to your subject, don't they? Yes, Salem Witch Trials resources are consistently our most viewed pages uh, in New England City histories. But you're really taking us beyond Salem today, right? Yes, we're gonna talk about some later cases. Fantastic, well, thank you so much for doing this and I will be back at the end to uh, moderate the questions. All right, thank you, Kyle, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, I want to start with just a little bit of background about historical witchcraft. Um, so when the English come to New England, they come with a complex set of beliefs about the world. Uh, in the early modern period, I think it's fair to say that magic and science and religion were not distinct categories. Uh, and that for these people, the invisible world was just as real as the visible, tangible world. And it can be kind of difficult to really understand that today. And in part, I think that's because historical magic and witchcraft has been shaped so much uh, by popular culture. So when we think about the Salem witch trials or we think about witches in New England, that, that idea that we have has really been largely shaped by popular culture. But uh, in the early modern period, magic and witchcraft um, were really universal beliefs. Um, so magic uh, as, a, as a concept was um, really across all human cultures and continues to be. Uh, but witchcraft became a special concern in the early modern period because it's a type of magic defined in this period as illegal. Uh, and because the, the, the Christians we're talking about today believed that it was caused by the devil. So I've got some images here of early modern witches um, to give you kind of a sense uh, of what these beliefs look like. So a lot of the English colonizers who come to New England believe that New England in particular is full of witches and demons and magical creatures. Cotton Mather wrote that uh, New Englanders are a people of God settled in those which were once the devil's territories. So Puritans in particular, and Cotton Mather echoes this belief, uh, believe that they were so godly themselves 
that they would, uh, that the devil would target them, especially, right? Because they were so godly that he was going to send an army of devils to try to destroy them and to make New England Satan's kingdom again. So what this means in practice is that the English treat indigenous people as if they were demons. They literally demonize indigenous leaders as demons and sorcerers. Uh, and, and so they're kind of innovating in some ways. Uh, they're, they're coming with a set of beliefs and practices from England, but they're also adapting some of those beliefs to their experiences in New England. So for example, some of the testimony in the Salem Witch Trials uh, describes the devil as looking like an indigenous man. Um, so historically, and also, you know, maybe even currently, magic is an important part of human culture. It's a part of science, art, literature, religion, and all of this contributes to a rich and complex history. When we're looking for evidence about these beliefs in New England, we can find information in court records for witch trials, uh, in folklore and local histories, through oral traditions, through people's personal correspondence and diaries, um, through archaeological studies, and of course, uh, in church records. So most of the ministers in, in early New England believed that all magic was diabolical, meaning it comes from the devil, um, and that witches received their powers from the devil in order to manipulate the weather, uh, to cure, cause disease, to destroy crops, to harm livestock. Um, for example, on the left here is a title page from William Perkins, A Discourse of the Damned Art of Witchcraft. Um, this was published a few years after he died, uh, published in England, but it was the most widely cited English treatise on witchcraft in the 17th century. And Perkins was uh, very in influential, his ideas and his sermons quite influential for Puritans in New England. They cited him often. And Perkins argued in this book um, that Basically, some people desired more power and knowledge than God would rightfully give them, and so they turned to sorcery, and that worked um, that basically people would, he said, they would attempt the cursed art of magic and witchcraft as a way to get further knowledge in mat matters secret and not revealed. So he said magic worked because when the witch says a spell or a charm, uh, that invokes the devil, who then uh, works wonders on their behalf. And so those wonders include creating storms, uh, causing disease, curing disease, destroying crops, harming livestock. So witches are all making a pact with the devil uh, and therefore deserve to be punished with death, uh, even good witches. So even people who aren't harming someone or not using magic to harm. Um, and he says that's because they are, quote, enemies to God and all true religion. However, despite what ministers said, many English people and many in New England as well uh, believed that there was a distinction between good magic and harmful witchcraft. So some of them believed that certain magical practices could in fact be put to use for legitimate Christian purposes. That argument was made in print um, in particular for types of magic like alchemy, astrology, and natural magic. And here, this image in the middle is the title page from William Lilly's Christian Astrology, published in London in 17, or I'm sorry, in 1647. And we know that there were copies of this book uh, and Lilly's works in New England because people mentioned them. Uh, there's a Connecticut witch trial where, uh, in particular, Lilly's astrology is mentioned. And if you're wondering, what, what is Christian astrology? Uh, this image on the right is an example from Lilly's book. And this is an example of how to calculate uh, astrologically whether or not you have been bewitched or your patient to find out whether or not you've been bewitched um, based on where the stars and planets were at at that time. So uh, astrology is a type of magic that people, many people in New England considered to be good magic. If you're healing, if you're fortune telling in a positive way, uh, finding lost items, those are all kind of beneficial types of magic. But when those things go wrong, um, if the healing magic fails, if a fortune was revealed to be frightening, then that's when we move into the realm of, realm of witchcraft that people typically want to see punished. So sometimes the intent and the outcome mattered more than the act of magic itself. So New Englanders cont con continued to believe in the same kind of folklore as other English people. They're doing things like using nails and salt and horseshoes and bay leaves to ward off evil spirits. There are a lot of examples from court records of New Englanders interested in magic. Um, 
we're, there are cases of people telling fortunes, reading palms, predicting someone's spouse, um, predicting deaths, uh, and then accusations of things like spoiling beer, turning into a cat, causing illness. Um, so it's interesting that I think a lot of what we know about magic in early New England has come to us from congregational ministers. So Increase Mather, Cotton Mather, John Hale, they all wrote and published treatises on witchcraft and magic that actually historians uh, and many other people still read today. There are also some pretty interesting unpublished writings by congregational ministers on witchcraft. I'm gonna talk about two of those today. So here is our first case. And this is uh, a little known treatise written by a minister named Ebenezer Turrell. So Turrell was the minister in Medford, Massachusetts. He was born in Boston, he attended Harvard. He's ordained as the minister in Medford in 1724 and he serves there for over 50 years. He was married three times. Uh, his first wife, Jane Coleman, was a daughter of a minister and also a poet. And one of the things that he wrote besides this treatise on witchcraft uh, was he wrote a memoir about his first wife uh, and his father-in-law. Um, we know a little bit about Turrell because uh, of the church records from Medford, because of his writings. Um, so the things that we know about him include that he admired Cotton Mather. He invited Cotton Mather to attend his ordination ceremony. Uh, Cotton Mather did not attend, but also like Mather, he was in favor of smallpox inoculation. He gave a sermon about it in 1730. There's also evidence that Turrell enslaved at least one person of African descent in his household, a man named Worcester. And we know that because it appears in uh, town records. And one of Turrell's parishioners in Medford was the wealthiest man in town, Colonel Isaac Royal, whose home is now a museum, the Royal House and Slave Quarters. But Turrell himself was also quite wealthy for his time. Uh, at his death, he left an estate worth 5,000 pounds. We also know that Turrell did not like the Reverend George Whitfield and preached against him. He said that followers of Whitfield, um, this is in the early 18th century, were possibly being led astray, he believed, by emotion and enthusiasm. And some of Turrell's parishioners left his congregation uh, over that issue, presumably because they, they preferred emotion uh, in their sermons. Um, so Turrell writes his brief treatise on witchcraft in 1728. Here is an image of it on the right. You can see it, that's in his hand. It's a pretty nice hand, uh, pretty legible. And he says that he's inspired to write this based on a case that involved three sisters, three young women in his congregation. They had previously lived in Littleton, Massachusetts, and then later moved to Medford, and they wanted to join Tur Turrell's congregation. He claimed that um, one of them was so moved by a sermon he gave on honesty that she confessed to him this incident that happened in Littleton several years prior. So he withholds their names uh, in his treatise, but he tells us that the incident takes place in 1720 when the three girls were 11, nine, and five years old. And the oldest, who uh, I know is called Elizabeth, um, gave Turrell her account uh, when she's about 18 or 19 years old. So this is, she's recalling what happened when she was 11. And she says, um, the trouble started because she was having strange dreams and falling into trances and had trouble reading the Bible. And she admitted that she'd been practicing some divination techniques, which Turrell notes was unlawful. Uh, suddenly their house becomes haunted. Uh, they start hearing strange noises in the house. There are stones falling down uh, into the chimney and Elizabeth is biting people. Turrell wrote, quote, he says, "'Twas very common to find her in ponds of water at a considerable distance from the house, crying out in great distress she should be drowned. Sometimes she would be seen on the top of the house and on the tops of trees, crying out that she should fall and kill herself. And when asked how she'd gotten there, she answered that she flew there." So the middle sister, in addition to Elizabeth, uh, was also appearing on top of the barn. Um, their parents were naturally concerned <laughs> about this, and they first called in a physician to examine them, and then also asked the church elders to pray for them. Many neighbors, once this uh, news got out, were also coming to visit the girls and to observe them. 
So Elizabeth uh, next accuses someone. So she accuses a woman in town of afflicting her. She says, this woman is causing these troubles uh, and that she sees her apparition in the household. Elizabeth's mother um, on the direction of Elizabeth does sort of a, has a battle with this apparition, which also takes the shape of a bird. Um, and allegedly the accused woman felt pain at the same time as Elizabeth's mother hit the bird, like the apparition of the bird. Um, the accused woman, woman at that time uh, was pregnant and she died a few weeks after this incident. And the children's affliction ceased at her death. The neighbor's attitudes though, according to Turrell, uh, were actually sympathetic both to the accused woman and to the children. So um, no uh, legal action was pursued by, by any of the neighbors. Um, and apparently the woman also forgave the girls for accusing her on her deathbed. So she forgave them for accusing her of witchcraft. One of the things that stands out in Turrell's writing uh, in this treatise, and it's, it's fairly short, um, but he uses a lot of very similar phrasing to Cotton Mather and John Hale uh, in their accounts of the Salem witch trials. So he mentions that the children were, quote, under an evil hand. He says they're afflicted by Satan. He says that um, Elizabeth was using um, a sieve and eggs to tell the future, uh, that she was being pinched by invisible hands, et cetera, right? So he even mentions the parallel to Salem himself. And these were events that had occurred, at this point, it's about 40 years prior to when Turrell is writing, uh, and they were still very well-known events. Um, and a minister like Turrell, in the Boston, greater Boston area, I think in the early 18th century was also pretty likely to have those treatises by uh, Cotton Mather and John Hale in his library or to have read them at some point. He was Harvard educated. So he also though, he notes the role of reading about Salem in Elizabeth's experience. So he says uh, that she, that her behavior, that she did it willingly and perversely, having read in some accounts of witchcraft that afflicted persons always do so. So he's saying that she was influenced by the literature about Salem, which was a fear that was expressed by other writers at the same time. Uh, it was the same concern expressed by a Church of England minister, Francis Hutchinson, in his um, historical essay concerning witchcraft, which was published in 1718. Hutchinson said, quote, these books and narratives are in tradesmen's shops and farmers' houses and are read with great eagerness and are continually leavening the minds of youth who delight in such subjects. So Hutchinson specifically calls out the Mathers, Cotton and Increase, he mentions John Hale too, for perpetuating these evil notions in their books um, that, that just reading about witchcraft in Salem in particular is something that uh, has a very negative influence on people. Um, so you can see at the top where it says the noises and disturbances. So this is where Turrell starts to kind of myth bust the case. So he's following in this tradition of many other skeptical writers, also like Francis Hutchinson at this time uh, in the early 18th century. So here he says, uh, he says, quote, the noises and disturbances in the house were made by these children who could climb up and down about it and upon it. So he's saying that they were actually climbing to the top of the trees, they were not flying. Um, and he says that they were biting and pinching themselves. It wasn't invisible hands. Um, he also tries to medicalize the symptoms of witchcraft. Um, he says that the accused woman, so the woman who was accused of witchcraft by the girls, that she had not actually been hurt when her apparition was attacked in the form of a bird, but rather he says um, that she had been applying a harsh and hot medicine um, which had been advised by a neighbor and that that medicine had took off the skin from one side of her face. So there's a medical cause. It wasn't a, a spectral apparition uh, attack that caused it. And then he discusses motive too. Um, so he kind of tries to psychologize these girls as well. He says, Elizabeth admitted she wanted to trick her parents and trick her neighbors because of quote, folly and pride. And that Elizabeth then persuaded her younger sisters to join in her, quote, hellish design of deceiving and grieving their parents and neighbors and serving the devil. And then he says that the youngest sister joined them, joined the two older sisters, because she noticed that her parents paid more attention to them um, and that they received more pity and more love uh, than she did. So she decided to join them as well, basically saying that it's attention seeking. And then he also notes that since the incident happened, 
Elizabeth had felt, quote, a gloominess upon her mind. So Elizabeth, he says, ends up confessing all of this to Turrell because they moved to Medford and because she wanted to become a member of Turrell's church. Um, she tells him that she had lied to her previous minister in Littleton, but was so moved by Turrell's sermon about lying that she was now ready to confess to him. And he said that she was bewailing and lamenting her egregious folly and weeping bitterly for it, desiring to be truly humble before God and man so long as she has a day to live. Apparently, she asked Turrell to write up this confession for her and then read it to, to the congregation while she stood there uh, next to him and he reads it, which I think is another uh, interesting parallel to Salem. Um, Turrell's description of this confession process is really similar to Anne Putnam's confession in 1706 to the church in Salem Village. Um, Anne Putnam was one of the accusers during the Salem Witch Trials. She was young. Um, she was involved in accusations of, I think, about 60 people. Uh, her name was on them anyway. And then in 1706, um, so uh, a decade and a half after the, after the trials, she asks her minister, Joseph Green, um, to read her confession to the congregation. She said she desired to be humbled before God, ask forgiveness, said that she'd been deluded by Satan. So I wonder if Turrell also had that uh, example in mind. And then Turrell also uses this, he uses his, um, his, his writing here to moralize to his readers. And so I'm giving you a big wall of text because I think his lesson is really interesting. So this is the lesson he wants everyone to take away from this. He says, young people would do wisely now to lay aside all their foolish books, their trifling ballads and all romantic accounts of dreams and trances, senseless palmistry and groundless astrology. Don't so much as look into these things Never use any of the devil's playthings. There are much better recreations than ledger domain tricks. Turn not to the sieve, to no futurities. Tis one of the greatest mercies of heaven to us that we are ignorant of them. So I really, I think that's a great line. He's saying, don't, uh, don't look into the future. You don't want to know. It's actually a mercy uh, that we don't know what the future holds for us. He says, if you do, um, uh, you're... You, you only gratify Satan uh, and invite him into your company to deceive you. Nothing that appears by this means, by divination, is to be depended upon. And then he goes on to tell us sp more specific examples. He says, the horseshoe is a vain thing. It doesn't work. Uh, people nail it to their houses and to ships. Um, but he says, if Satan should by such means defend you from lesser dangers, tis to make way for greater ones <laughs> and get fuller possession of your hearts. And then he also says uh, it's evil to hang papers on the neck for the cure of agues to bind and to bind up the weapon instead of the wound. Those are both folk magic uh, practices or healing. So what I love about this practice or this paragraph here is that unintentionally he's giving us an, an account of what people in 1720s Massachusetts were up to. Right? He says they love their foolish books. They like astrology. They like fortune telling. They're doing protection magic and folk medicine. And he disapproves of all of these practices. He says they're not real and they don't work. But he's also very careful to note in this treatise that he does believe in the existence of spirits, uh, of ghosts. He believes in the invisible world and the powers of Satan. And then he finally he kind of concludes his treatise by giving some advice to parents and masters. He says, you must not indulge your children. You must not encourage them and you must not suffer sin upon them. The rod of correction may sometimes be properly and seasonably applied to drive this folly from them. So ultimately, I think he's trying to find kind of a middle way between being a little too credulous or too skeptical, skeptical about um, some of these kind of wonders uh, and, and trying to get to the bottom of what, what had happened in this case in Littleton. So it's a fascinating little treatise and you can read it uh, online on our website. My second case takes place in New Hampshire. And uh, New Hampshire is really not often mentioned in histories of witchcraft, although it, it is occasionally. And I think partly that's because no one was executed for witchcraft in New Hampshire, although there were some really, really interesting cases. There are some, a couple of formal accusations and trials for witchcraft that take place in seacoast towns uh, during the 17th century. Um, but the case I wanna talk about today takes place much more rural part of the state and much, much later. So to set the scene, 
Uh, this is taking place in Campton and Thornton, which are two towns in Grafton County, New Hampshire, which is in the White Mountains. If you ever drive up 93 towards Franconia Notch, you will go through Campton uh, and Thornton. So the, these towns were both granted in the 1760s. Um, it's a period after the War of Independence when New Hampshire is expanding its population, expanding the economy, and all these new towns are being established, pushing further north and west. And one of the leading figures in this area is Reverend Selden Church, who comes to Campton from Connecticut in 1774. He's a graduate of Yale. Uh, he's ordained in October of 1774 as the minister in Campton. Uh, the town provided rum and cake um, for his ordination for the town. And uh, they build a meeting house a couple years after he arrives. Um, but unfortunately, a 19th century historian of, of Camden noted that the early records of this church were destroyed. So we have this document. And this is really uh, the only record I've seen so far, uh, although if you know of more, please tell me, about this particular case. So the document we have here is written by Reverend Selden Church, and it's signed by a group of 14 men. Um, keen observers in the audience <laughs> will recognize the hallmarks of a busy historian taking photos uh, in a hurry in a reading room. You can tell the angle and the shadows in the photo. These are not the best quality. There are better ones coming, uh, but these are at the, uh, the New Hampshire Historical Society. So this is what a couple pages of this document look like. It's three, uh, three pages in total. Um, so the men who sign it, these 14 men plus uh, Reverend Church, are mostly men of property. They live in Campton, some live in Thornton, which is a neighboring town to the north. And the document concerns a woman called Polly Wiley. There's a much more famous Polly Wiley in New Hampshire history, but um, it's not her. That's the Wiley landslide disaster, different, different one. Um, so I suspect that this Polly Wiley, uh, Mar uh, Polly being like a nickname for Mary in this period, um, the only ones that appear in vital records are Mary. So there's a Mary Wiley, who's the wife of Darius Wiley, who comes to Campton from Connecticut, um, similarly to Reverend Church in about 1770. So I think it's either her um, or her daughter. Who's, there's a, a daughter called Mary. Um, and uh, the husband, Darius, he had served in the war. They had a farm. Uh, he was a proprietor of the town. So they're fairly high status, but they're the only Marys or Pollys uh, that I can find in vital records at this time. And I don't think it's clear from the document whether they're talking about an adult or a child. Um, it's, a, it's a fairly short document, like I said. They don't refer to Polly as being anyone's wife. Um, her affliction sounds similar to those of bewitched children in other cases. So I'm not sure. Several questions remain about this document and the people involved. But if we take it at face value, here's what it says happened. So the men who signed this seem to be responding to an accusation of witchcraft made by Polly Wiley against several unnamed persons in the community. And the men are unsure, they say, whether Polly herself is bewitched, possessed by the devil, or has some medical illness. Yet, they say, there is, quote, reason to suspect the agency of evil spirits in the affair. So they're not sure. So this is the 1790s. Um, this is after the American Revolution, and they're, they think it's not, they're not, it's not safe to be positive, they say, whether it's the devil or witchcraft or illness. And in a very nice turn of phrase, they say that uh, they suspect, quote, the agency or instrumentality of evil invisible spirits. So Reverend Church refers to the difficulties attending Polly Wiley, the evidence that he specifies here, uh, he describes that there are, he says there are wounds and scratches on her body. They also mention that she sees people who are invisible to others present in the room. So she's seeing, uh, uh, she's seeing their specters or their spirits. Um, and that she has accused those people that she's seen uh, of witchcraft. So on the surface, this does sound sort of similar to the previous case I've mentioned with Reverend Turrell, right? A minister has become the arbiter of an unusual affliction in his community. And someone in this case, Polly, is now making accusations against others. Not only is she accusing people of witchcraft, it sounds like people from the town and from other towns are coming to visit her and they're testing her and asking her questions, asking her to name the witches in the community. 
So it, it's a situation that perhaps could have spiraled into something much more dangerous. And we can also see there's some parallels to Salem again, right, in the spectral evidence and in the um, asking the afflicted to name the names of other witches. So Reverend Church notes that if she is possessed by the devil, it could be that the devil is presenting her with the spirits of innocent people, that he's trying to trick her in order to de destroy peace in society. But then he also says, well, but it, if, it's, if it is a case of witchcraft, then a witch might take the shape of an innocent person because he says, we know they can take the form of a cat or a dog. Why not an innocent person? And so he writes, and here's another uh, uh, just delightful sample from this. So he says, um, hence we conceive that great caution is requisite in order to prevent the injury of innocent characters, that it is not best to be inquisitive with her to name persons whom she supposes she hath seen as witches, that all persons should be very careful with regard to entertaining prejudices against any persons on account of her naming them as witches, and although there have been in some instances imprudent measures taken by some who have attended the said Polly Wiley, Yet considering the trials they have met with and the reasons they have had to suspect the agency of an evil hand, we would recommend a tender mind and deportment that all reasonable allowances be made. So these 15 men agree uh, that there is cause to suspect invisible forces at work, possibly evil, but they're cautious. So what can we learn from this? Uh, I think we can say that ministers' writings, both Reverend Turl and Reverend Church, are reflecting the concerns of their communities. It's clear that from both of these men, these, these ministers, that witchcraft was a concern throughout the 18th century, right? Reverend Turl's writing in the 1720s and Reverend Church here uh, uh, probably in the 1790s. So witchcraft accusations did not stop after Salem, but as we know, people become more careful in how they are handled. And I think these are both good examples of that. Um, although there are several notable instances uh, in Massachusetts and New Hampshire actually where community action, sometimes violent action is taken against people suspected of witchcraft. Uh, certainly actually that, that's continuing uh, even through the 19th century. And then I think both of these accounts demonstrate that New Englanders continued to be interested in magic and witchcraft, and that it was an important subject for ministers to be knowledgeable about. Lastly, uh, people continued to have a really difficult time figuring out when something unusual happens, was it witchcraft? Was it Satan? Was it ghosts? Was it illness? So a lot of this is a matter of interpretation and it continues to be a matter of interpretation and one that people are still turning to ministers for, uh, or start, start, still turning to ministers for to, to kind of be the arbiters of that, uh, to help them make decisions. But in both of these cases too, physicians were also called in uh, to provide expertise. So I also just wanna take a minute today uh, to highlight some of the very exciting resources that we have at the Congregational Library and Archives for people who are interested in the history of witchcraft. We have a extensive collection of works by Cotton Mather, including several first editions uh, and some manuscript materials. We also worked with the Phillips Library a few years ago to digitize Salem Witch Trials documents that had not previously been digitized. And we're updating that page on our website currently to expand it with even more resources about the Salem Witch Trials. And it's, it's those pages of Salem Witch Trial documents that continue to be by far um, some of the most popular on our website. And then one thing we have that uh, is not well known at all, uh, but again, speaks to this fact that witchcraft was an important subject for ministers to be knowledgeable about, is we've got um, quite a, an extensive collection of 19th and early 20th centuries, centuries histories of New England witchcraft. Um, so it was still an ongoing concern for, uh, for ministers when the library was founded here in 1853. Um, that cover in the middle is truly delightful. That was written actually by a Methodist minister from Maine, but it's called Witch Hill, a history of Salem witchcraft, including illustrative sketches of persons and places. You can see the souvenir edition uh, of Pearly's Salem Village Witchcraft and another book, um, The Salem Witch Trials, which also um, 
the one in the middle and on the right were prepared for um, like Sunday school audiences um, to read, to learn about witchcraft. So I think these are some of our uh, truly unique resources here at the library that um, some historians don't know about. And some of our uh, audience who is interested in learning about the history of, of witchcraft might want to come in and see sometime. Please let me know if you do, I will show them to you. Um, so thank you very much. I look forward to hearing your questions. That's great, Tricia, thanks so much. Happy Halloween. Perfect. <laughs> looks like our looks like our staff meeting today. Uh, no, it doesn't. Tag yourself. <laughs> yeah, I'm sort of fascinated by that. Uh, you know, as people are asking their questions and as they're coming in, maybe you could start off a little bit about, well, why would we even want to read 19th century histories about witchcraft? I mean, certainly scholars today must know more than they did in the 19th century. Um but do you see a value, you know, other than, you know, kind of neat covers? Oh, yes. So I, the images are truly beautiful, um, but there is a value. Um, actually, um, one of the ways I think that some of these earlier works have contributed to our current knowledge is, and um, correct me if I'm wrong, anybody in the audience, but I think that the um, Proctor's Ledge project in Salem, where um, historians uh, Emerson Baker work and, and others work to establish where the site of the hangings was in Salem. And when they established where that was, I think some of that information came from looking at the old maps that are published. And I think particularly like Charles Upham's um, maps of Salem from the 19th century. And so I think that actually those surprisingly, some of those books um, have information that really is still valuable for historians today. But then also just from a historiographical perspective, it is, Salem is one of those topics that um, scholars continue to interpret and reinterpret over and over again. And I think part of that is because our, you know, our values as a society change, our ideas about society change. So there've been so many different interpretations of what caused the Salem witch trials. And um, if you wanna really trace that line of intellectual thought and how people interpret and understand it, you have to go back to those lovely 19th and 20th century uh, interpretations. And uh, we have many here. Uh, so again, an invitation, the library is open Monday through Friday, nine to five. Uh, send us an email, set up an appointment. Uh, we would love to pull them out. And uh, Trisha, you're usually in the office what, on, on Wednesdays. Mm -hmm. uh, so a perfect day for anybody out there who wants to come down and, and get to see these things uh, in person. Uh, the questions are rolling in. There's a, a great question here uh, from a Anna Swingren asking, when did witchcraft stop being an issue in congregational communities? Mm. Does it does it peter out at any point or? Um, yeah, I would say it, you know, that the, the cases I talked about today in the 18th century are really the probably the tail end of it being an issue where ministers are going to be involved and a, and a whole community would be involved. Um, the case that case in New Hampshire is pretty late for a minister to be weighing in. <laughs> um, but I think that's why it's so interesting. The, you know, I think one of the things that was really striking me kind of building on that is the statement you had made that there are no witchcraft executions in New Hampshire. There were similarly none in Rhode Island, but there were in Connecticut and Massachusetts. Does that again go back to kind of the, the congregational stronghold in those areas? Uh, you know, I think when we think about Rhode Island, we think about more of a pluralist religious landscape. Um, I know a little bit less about congregationalism in New Hampshire, but what, what do you do with why some areas are more prone to, you know, to execution or to, you know, even more, maybe even more, uh, you know, fervent persecution uh, than others? There, there does seem to be a correlation between Puritan strongholds uh, and, you know, willingness to execute people for witchcraft. New Hampshire kind of somewhat similarly to Rhode Island is also ends up being um, a place where people who like, um, like Wheelwright, who, who founds Exeter, New Hampshire, uh, like he's leaving <laughs> because he has disagreements with other Puritans. So New Hampshire also um, had kind of a more secular maritime population too in the 17th century. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a correlation. I think that's a, it's an interesting thing to debate and to think about because we can't really have a definite answer on, on that. Um, but it does kind of, yeah, clearly it's the Puritan strongholds in particular that 
are the hotbeds uh, for witch trials and accusations. Uh, great question here from Michael Polich, pulling on what you were talking about at the at the start about sort of uh, interpretations of indigenous peoples uh, mm -hmm. and their relationship. And he kind of asked, you know, uh, kind of turning that around, did, indi did any indigenous people ever use the European beliefs against them? You know, for instance, would they say that they would punish Europeans with their magic? You know, again, you know, kind of quotes here for those terms. Uh, if they did not do what they wanted. So is it a, is it a, is there evidence that it's a sort of two-way street, I guess, in some ways? It's hard to say for sure, but English writers in the 16th and 17th century visiting, you know, early North America, their early voyages to North America mention that. So they do say like um, that, uh, that they think that there are indigenous sorcerers calling up storms to keep the English away. Um, uh, in New Hampshire. So William Wood in the 1630s, he writes that Passaconaway, who's a leader of the Pentecook, that Passaconaway had the power to um, make the trees dance and make water burn and that he could bring plants and animals back to life. So the English are um, kind of trying to cast him as a powerful wizard uh, in that writing. And that's, that's kind of common in a lot of the early English uh, travel writing about New England. Great, well, thank you. Uh, Michelle Berry writes that the Littleton case is very interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, Michelle is with the Littleton Historical Society, and they have no knowledge of this event. Oh. And, you know, so how is it that these works help us kind of understand community histories in new ways? And, and you know, as a public historian, you know, I wonder what, what would you say are, how should a community in the 21st century know about you know, things that happened three centuries ago. Are, are there lessons to learn or sites for kind of community identity or or such? Yeah, I think I'm excited about this comment because um, I think this case is not particularly well known. And, um, you know, our, this art digitization of this text, which is actually it's held by the New England Historic Genealogical Society, they have the manuscript and we've digitized it and put it online. But uh, many people do not know about Turrell in this case. So he's writing in Medford. He says the case took place in Littleton. I did a little poking around to see what I could find about Littleton um, because Turrell doesn't give the name of the family. He gives us the letter that their last name starts with. So I was looking through vital records in Littleton, but I'm there's a few families I think it could be. Um, but I think it would be great for people to look into it further and see what else we can find out because, you know, Salem is a great example of, um, well, it's, a, it's an interesting example of the way that a community has taken on the responsibility of being a site of historical violence, right? Uh, where people were executed. So there's currently, um, there's two monuments within Salem. There's another monument uh, in Memorial in Danvers. Uh, there's probably about, a, I think about a dozen, over a dozen now uh, monuments to people who were accused or executed of witchcraft in New England. Um, so I think it's, you know, that's something that communities can certainly consider today in doing projects like thinking about um, how they want to uh, shape public memory about people accused of witchcraft. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, I mean, it, it was fascinating with some of the details you were offering there, knowing three daughters, their ages, and maybe even the, unless it's, you know, unless he's changing the names to protect the innocent, the name of the, the eldest one, um, would be fascinating to, to, to dig deeper and hopefully yeah. uh, Michelle, you and you and Michelle can connect. And, yes, uh, Michelle, get in touch if you, <laughs> you have some leads on that. I'd love to figure out which family they were so we can find more information about them. Uh, so, uh, Charles Hambrick Stowe, long-term friend of the Congregational Library, points out that you have somebody over your shoulder for this entire talk. Uh, you want to want to point out who yes. who's in your office? Uh, so the larger portrait um, was a is a Congregationalist uh, minister and writer. Uh, the smaller portrait that some of you can see is a beautiful um, uh, a beautiful beautiful portrait of Reverend Cotton Mather, and I'm delighted to have him in my office. <laughs> Um, because I think he uh, will express his disagreement uh, with much of what I said about him, probably. <laughs> but it does it does remind me uh, that he's always uh, looking over my shoulder there and watching what I'm up to. <laughs> so Charles uh, further asks, uh, he's always assumed that the Salem trials were the last time that spectral evidence 
was considered admissible in a court of law. And that spectral evidence was largely discredited as a result of what happened in Salem in 1692. Um, but that, that spectral evidence did continue to be used in European courts well into the 18th century. Uh, is there truth to these, uh, to the, this kind of understanding of where spectral evidence falls and how it can be used, uh, how, it, how it was used in, in courts of law? So spectral evidence um, continues to, uh, to appear after the Salem Witch Trials. There's a huge disagreement about the use of spectral evidence. Cotton Mather actually, even at the end of his life, he still was never... He, he never really accepted that it wasn't valid. And I think that's a line that um, that Selden, Reverend Church is, uh, is kind of towing to. He's, he's, he's walking on this line of, you know, it's possible, but it could be, uh, it could be caused by the devil or it could be the witch taking the shape of an innocent person. So even a hundred years later, a, min a congregational minister in New Hampshire is still not convinced that spectral evidence is completely invalid, right? Because if you completely discount it, then you're saying that spirits don't exist. And then uh, you're essentially saying that God doesn't exist either. Um, so it was a tricky one to really get rid of. It's also, um, uh, there's a, a great book, um, Killed Strangely, uh, about a murder case in Rhode Island in the 17th century that used spectral evidence. So it, you know, it is something that's, that was used in court, um, uh, probably for the best that we don't use it now. Probably, yeah. <laughs> um... A uh, big thank you from Pat Fondle, another great friend of the Congregational Library. Um, you know, fascinating. She writes, fascinating to know that this topic was still a concern, you know, into the very, you know, beginning part of the 19th century in New England. You know, asked an important question about region. You know, um, can we say that that witchcraft kind of holds on in the rural areas and in the kind of more urban areas? It's it's been discounted. Um or is that is that dangerous to kind of assume that this is you know that there, that dichotomy sort of exists um, you know so a way of thinking and and I guess it, maybe it's a way also to think about the kind of folk practices in general that you were talking about so that even as witchcraft might not be said or might not come into court um, but is belief in folk approaches still going strong uh, beyond uh, as we move into the nineteenth century. Yeah, so I think that rural versus urban narrative of like, you know, it's rural communities that are holdouts, um, even into like some of the wonderful folk horror movies of the 1970s, where there's like, like the Wicker Man, right? Like there's this, there's communities of people still practicing, uh, you know, ancient forms of witchcraft, uh, because they're in these remote, isolated, isolated areas. Um, uh, it doesn't always hold up. There are cases, uh, witchcraft accusations, and still, certainly people using different kinds of magic in urban areas. There's the famous case of someone being accused of witchcraft in Philadelphia during the Constitutional Convention. Great. Uh, so Marilyn Roach, uh, great Salem historian, writes uh, in regard to what you're saying about Proctor's Ledge, uh, that they found uh, Sidney Purley's late 19th. Oh, Purley. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Marilyn. Yes, it was Sidney Purley, not Charles Upham. Thank you. Well, also, yes, another yeah, early historian of Salem. So for, for all of you who, who don't know Purley, uh, he was making maps, I guess, in the 19th and 20th century uh, and had articles on Salem neighborhoods that was really invaluable. Yes. So and I've used his map so many times, I can't believe I forgot Sidney Purley. <laughs> Uh, great question here. You know, you you talked about the way in which indigenous peoples came to be sort of vilified through uh, witchcraft. Did African Americans find themselves subjected in a similar way? So um, there are some cases of enslaved people of African descent being accused of witchcraft. Um, um, a couple during the Salem witch trials. Um, uh, there's a case in an early case in Connecticut where uh, a woman who's being accused of witchcraft include, uh, decides to kind of turn that on its head and accuse an enslaved person in her household, uh, an enslaved man, of being the one who's actually doing the, um, doing the magic. He says that he's like purposefully spoiling her beer. Um, uh, in Salem, there's the case of Candy, uh, an enslaved uh, woman of African descent is quite interesting because she also um, takes the opportunity of giving her testimony to advocate for herself by saying, 
that it was her white mistress uh, who inducted her into witchcraft. So yeah, there are some really interesting cases. And when we read about indigenous people or people of African descent being accused of witchcraft in the 17th century or involved in these cases, always have to also read it through that lens of, you know, understanding what else was going on and, and those power relationships. Great, thank you. Uh, Christine Eisel asks, are any of those 19th century histories that we were talking about a little bit earlier uh, available digitally? She's teaching an undergraduate course on witchcraft, sorcery, and magic in early America, which sounds like a course that I would love to sign up for. So thank you so much, Christine, for offering that. Um, and says, you know, it really would be great to incorporate those 19th century histories to explore changing, or possibly not, ideas about witchcraft and magic. Yes, and there are several of them are on, available online um, through like archive.org uh, has copies of several of them. Um, I can think of some, I can find them and send links to if you want, just uh, email me for those copies. But yeah, it is, it's a, a really interesting way to consider how our ideas about historical witchcraft have changed over time. Great. Um, Louise Breen, uh, it was fascinated by your mention that the first minister, Terrell, uh, was opposed to the revivalism of George Whitfield, you know, and was, uh, was you know this kind of condemnation of reading of witch literature intertwined with a disdain for religious enthusiasm, right? Which we feel is whipping up. In other words, this sort of coalesce with an upcoming conflict between old lights and new lights in in the 18th century. Yeah, I definitely see that parallel, and I think um, you know I think there are kind of intimations uh, that followers of Whitfield are you know so enthusiastic. <laughs> um, that, you know, that they're kind of being whipped up into this fury that uh, I think that, that some some of their, um, uh, some of those people who are very much opposed to Whitfield, like Terrell, uh, feel that, you know, it's almost inciting Satan. I think that, that, that there, you know, there are some, uh, some writings that kind of follow along those terms. Like, you know, if you go too much with the emotions um, that you will lead yourself into uh, a frenzy. Uh, perhaps a witch's Sabbath. What I, what I find fascinating is the way in which I think you've made such a strong case for the way, for witchcraft being in, intertwined, right? That this isn't something that we can kind of just say, oh yes, witchcraft happened in these isolated incidents. I wonder, you know, an area that might be a little more surprising for folks is that kind of intersection with the history of science and maybe even alchemy. And I know you've done a lot of work in those areas, how where you know how might we look at those areas to maybe even better understand the complexity of that time period? So I think um, uh, John Winthrop Jr. is a great example uh, of that. And so he was a colonial governor of Connecticut. It's a great book about him by Walt Woodward. Um, uh, Prospero's Prospero. I uh, can't remember the title off the top of my head anymore. Um, but. Uh, John Wyndham Jr., he's involved in cases of witchcraft. So um, in the 1660s in Connecticut, several people are accused and on trial for witchcraft. And Winthrop essentially says that these women that have been accused uh, are not capable of practicing real magic because only learned, educated men can do magic. <laughs> you know, what these women are accused of, this is, this is you know, this is the work of peasants. This is um, illiterate uh you know unintelligent people are are, are are interested in witchcraft and this is what they're accused of women couldn't possibly wrap their tiny little minds around something as difficult as real magic so he's saying this witchcraft is not real this is just superstitious old women what is real to him is alchemy and the quest for uh like the philosopher's stone wow <laughs> uh judith cataldo uh shares that uh, Harwood's historical sketch of the town of Littleton has information about the Littleton case. So uh, that's a good thing to kind of look up uh, and see what's in there. I think uh, we have a copy of that in the library, actually. Oh, good. <laughs> uh, Debbie Glenn Allen writes, uh, during a visit to Salem a few years ago, she came up upon a statement that the Puritans believed that God would punish the entire community for the sins of one person. And thus they needed to get rid of the sinner or, you know, as we can extrapolate, the witch. Can you say something more about how this influenced the witch hy hysteria 
um, you know, she's trying to reconcile how the killing of witches could be considered a Christian act in any sort of way. Hmm. Um, yeah, I think Cotton Mather, I will quote Cotton Mather or paraphrase Cotton Mather on that one. He believed that um, that there was this horrid army of devils uh, uh, attacking Salem um, and that that was what had stirred up all this witchcraft and that it was because people had fallen away uh, from the, you know, kind of the founding, the first generation uh, of early Puritan settlers that they'd gotten further and further, they'd accepted the halfway covenant, you know, they, they're just getting further and further from this original idea of what New England was going to be. Um, and so this, the sending of all these witches and demons to Salem, Cotton Mather says, is, is a result of that. And so, um, like it's due to people's own wickedness that had brought this upon them and that this is a justified uh, suffering that they're going through. Um, and so that is gonna ne necessitate really a, a, a cleansing, a confession, <laughs> and um, uh, uh, that that's the only way to really clean themselves of the sin is by getting rid of all these unsavory elements, but also even innocent people looking inside themselves um, and thinking about why they're wicked and sinful. Mm -hmm. Well, we are almost at the two o'clock hour. There are many more questions that are in the Q&A, um, and I will be downloading all of those and sending those to you, Tricia, uh, for you to reach out to the folks who asked them. Um, thank you so much uh, for sharing your knowledge with us today, for introducing me to two cases that I had never heard of and uh, am excited to be able to learn more about. Uh, and if you're in the Boston area, come by 14 Beacon Street and let us show you some of the great treasures we have here. Thank you. Thank you.